It occurred to me recently that Nintendo's Wii Remote Controller bears all the hallmarks of what should be a really popular piece of hardware within the modding community. However, it so far seems to have been largely ignored as a means for creating custom controllers with a distinct aesthetic and possibly even more versatile functionality. I wanted to understand why this might be the case, so I bought a load of faulty and untested controllers to investigate, found some coloured replacement shells to buy, and embarked on a journey of exploring the possibilities of Wiimote modification, and hopefully I'll be able to encourage other modders to get involved too. Hi and welcome back to The Shed. I'm Joe Bleeps and in this video I'll be going through the process of how I put together this great little custom pink Wii Remote and I'll be taking a look at the potential of this controller as a viable platform to mod, repair, refurbish and even repurpose Nintendo's revolutionary controller. This is a Wii Remote, also known as a Wiimote. You'll more than likely recognise it and there's probably been at least one of these in your household at some point over the last 15 years or so. We're so familiar with the Wiimote that it's easy to overlook just how fantastic the design of this thing is. This innovative, one-handed, motion-sensing controller for Nintendo's Wii and Wii U consoles is a design classic and, in my opinion, it's been so far overlooked by the majority of the modding community, myself included. And I have to wonder why. It integrates a whole host of clever features in a clean, minimalist package. It takes simple rectangular shape and makes it surprisingly ergonomic. It's got aesthetic and functional elements that hark back to Nintendo's original NES controllers, but also presented a whole new way of controlling video games with a strikingly different design and control system to Nintendo's previous hardware. There are 12 button inputs on the controller itself with an elegant symmetry that's just crying out for customization with different buttons and color schemes. It functions wide wirelessly via Bluetooth and as a result it's got the potential to connect to a whole range of hardware in addition to the Wii and the Wii U. There are of course drawbacks to modding the Wiimote. The Nintendo Wii was released in the UK back in December 2006 but despite this controller having been around for over 16 years it doesn't yet have seemed to qualify as retro hardware and currently seems to be stuck in limbo between the desirability of modern consoles and vintage classics. Faulty controllers are very common on eBay suggesting the longevity of the controllers themselves comes into question. Having now tried to repair a number of these controllers, it seems that the troubleshooting list is rather long and that a lot of issues can arise, some of which are easy to address, but others still have me scratching my head. Now, it took me a long time to find some shell replacements for these controllers. The basic quality, in a limited range of colours, there's no button sets available outside the ones that come with these shells and there's nothing like the range of custom parts available for the Game Boy console, for instance. So the opportunities to create your own unique designs is limited. Although the hardware has Bluetooth functionality, more exploration is needed from people far cleverer than me to investigate the possibilities and practicalities of its implementation outside of Wii consoles. I can't shake a nagging suspicion that someday in the near future, the humble Wiimote could become as desirable with collectors and modders as Nintendo's Game Boy and DS consoles are today. But I wanted to find out for myself what might be putting people off and also wanted to lead the charge in terms of at least exploring some of the mods that might be possible with this little design icon. So that's why I bought broken controllers and replacement shells and kicked things off with this custom hot pink Wiimote. How did it go? Let's take a look. So from a box of faulty controllers, I managed to get a few working, leaving me with a suitable donor for my project. It was missing a battery cover, needed a good clean, and some buttons were discolored. So this was a perfect candidate for a new shell. First thing to do when testing is to put a fresh pair of alkaline AA batteries in there, press any button and the LEDs should light up. If you press the sync button inside, they'll flash as it tries to connect to a console. After some searching online, I found a supplier on eBay selling replacement shells for both the remote and the nunchuck controllers. At £2.99 and available in three somewhat random colours of red, blue and pink, I decided I may as well order the lot and take a look. Now of the kits I bought, I chose to try the pink one first. It was a similar shade of pink to my PlayStation 2 Slim and my PSP 1000, so I thought it might make a good addition to the collection. Quick amendment and apology, I realised as soon as I sat down to edit the video that I've been referring to the B trigger as the Z trigger all the way through, so sorry about that. I'm still getting to know this controller. 
Taking a look at the kit itself, it's cheap, so there are always going to be quality issues, but for such a low cost, it's actually not too bad. There's the controller shell, the nunchuck shell, which I'll attempt another time, and a bag of internal parts and buttons. I decided on a mix and match approach for a distinctive aesthetic, as well as the authenticity brought to the end result by using the original buttons. The D-pad and Z-trigger were yellowed, so I needed to address that as part of the process. Looking at all the other controllers I'd bought, this seemed like a common trait, so looking into the restoration of the colour was actually something worth trying for what I might do moving forward in the long run. I also got a red and a blue set, so I could even put together a sort of Super Mario style controller fairly easily with those in a future project. The replacement shell has power and home labelled on it but is otherwise very minimal. It's also got the same finish as the original controller with a matte finish on the lower half and a glossy finish on the top half. So on with the process. First you'll need to open up your controller by taking off the battery cover if you have one and then removing the four screws inside the battery compartment with a tri-wing screwdriver. The shell has two plastic clips inside and it's quite tricky to separate. They're roughly aligned with the top half of the D-pad and with a spudger and a little patience you should be able to pop one of them open and the second one will come away fairly easily. It's easier to do this with the controller on a flat surface. Just before the clip there's extra bits of plastic within the structure that will get in the way so do be patient the top clips over the bottom so you need to pry the top wider so you can move the edge away from the hole that it's located in. These buttons will likely fall out during the process but don't worry that won't cause any problems so long as you don't lose them. Sometimes the clip can break but that doesn't seem to cause any major issues actually. Fortunately for me I was using a replacement shell but if you're just refurbishing or repairing it's worth taking extra care for this step. Inside you'll find the LED guide, the speaker, the dust guard for the speaker, buttons A, 1, 2, plus, minus, home and power as well as the d-pad and all the silicon membranes these buttons are high quality with two-part moldings the labeling is integral to the buttons and it's not going to come off when you're polishing them there is poor quality misaligned printing on the replacement buttons but that may well polish off afterwards for a cleaner finish there was a little corrosion on the surface of the motherboard i used a toothbrush a spudger and isopropyl alcohol on a cotton bud to clean it up using a knife to carefully scrape off the more stubborn bits i inspected and cleaned up the silicon membranes where required and then looked for any other areas of corrosion or battery leakage and took a similar approach. Remove the infrared transmitter window and give it a polish with a microfiber cloth to deal with any minor scratches. You can do the same with the clear top on the A button to achieve a nice shiny finish. Remove the Z trigger by applying pressure at the hinge end on the outside of the controller and at the base inside to unclip it from the shell. The battery connector inside is actually tricky to remove because it hooks in place. You need to ease the plastic out of the way and then it should slide easily out of the shell. Mine had some corrosion on so I put some more isopropyl and a toothbrush to work and cleaned it up fairly quickly. Next I carried out a process known as RetroBrite on the D-pad and the Z trigger which involves first cleaning up the parts then coating them with peroxide cream and then leaving leaving them under UV light for an hour or so, repeating the process if required. Rinse and dry thoroughly after each treatment to remove any traces of peroxide and they'll come up nice and bright white in theory. It's a good idea to wear silicon gloves when you're handling the peroxide cream or at the very least ensure you don't get any on your hands washing any off straight away if it comes in contact with your skin. While these parts were hopefully becoming whiter I started on the replacement shell using a spudger to carefully help pop it open. The parts look largely the same as the originals at first glance but there's a few differences that need addressing. Now I'll show you these as we move forward. I unhooked the rumble motor from the plastic frame on the motherboard and then removed the frame itself to check the circuitry underneath for any corrosion or damage. Mine was all fine in this case. I took the new cage from the kit and attached it with the button membrane for the Z trigger to the motherboard. To make the alignment easier just look for a round hole on the PCB for the plastic peg to go in place and then it just clips in place. The motor may be a loose fit but it's easy to stick it in place with a little bit of blue tack if needed. I did a test fit with the buttons and found that the white ones all looked really good. They don't locate fully when the shell's sitting face down, so this would be easier with some sort of stand to raise the assembly up off a flat surface. I noticed the one and two buttons wouldn't actually fit in the new shell, even though the replacement ones did, but with a little trimming of the tabs using my flush cutters, it was easy to locate the buttons precisely. Thankfully, all the other buttons fitted in place with no modification needed. To reassemble, put the buttons in place first and then attach the silicon membranes. 
lens. At this stage, I was missing the D-pad, of course, as it was still being exposed under UV light. Locate the speaker, being sure to remember to put the dust guard in place first. Then put the LED guides in place. This is a single clear plastic frame that just goes straight into all four holes. Although a replacement part came with the kit, I did use the one that came with the original controller. With a quick check holding the buttons in place, the color scheme looked good. After rinsing the peroxide cream from the D-pad and Z-trigger, they looked much better than they did before. A quick side-by-side -side comparison with another controller shows just how effective and worthwhile this process was. I won't be throwing out the pink buttons, they are being kept for a future project. Button sets aren't available separately for Wiimotes, so it's definitely worth keeping hold of those. Now I realised I could actually use the top of the old shell to make a quick assembly stand for this and any other upcoming Wiimote projects, simply by adding an extra hole for the power button when the layout is mirrored horizontally. I marked it out with a pencil, used my Dremel to open out the hole and cleaned it up with a needle file. It actually worked really well. I clicked the newly refurbished Z trigger in the pink lower shell and the hinge functioned correctly with the trigger locating well. I slid the battery terminals back in place but again this was tricky, partly due to the design and partly because of the mould quality of the pink shell. With a little bit of perseverance using a spudger to carefully widen the opening, it slid neatly in place and it was held securely. A tiny spot of blue tack held the motor in place so it didn't fall out when the motherboard was flipped over and located back in the shell. It was at this point I realised the motherboard didn't actually fit properly in the shell. This might not apply to all motherboards, it seems there are a few different revisions, however it turned out that there was a plastic ridge that had got in the way of some of the components. Flush cutters and a knife made short work of it, removing the excess plastic and allowing the motherboard to sit more securely in the shell. I put the infrared window back in place and reassembled the two halves face down, carefully applying pressure to connect the two clips near the D-pad and then putting the four screws back in place. As this is the first time screws are going into the new shell, you'll need to tap a thread by doing a repeated clockwise anti-clockwise twist bit by bit to cut a neat thread for the screw to locate. Don't over tighten, this plastic's really cheap and it'll strip easily if you're not careful. Look for any excess bits of moulded plastic that may need cleaning up and then put two batteries in place and tap the sync button to check that everything is working. After this, simply replace the battery cover, remove the protective film on the top shell and give it a polish with a soft cloth if necessary. And that's it. A relatively simple operation with a few tweaks required to allow us to use the original buttons in the new shell. If you're planning to use the replacement buttons, the procedure would have been even smoother as there's no trimming or retro bright needed. However, I really like how it looks with the original white buttons, so I'm glad that's what I chose to do. Now it's all reassembled, it actually looks a lot better than I anticipated. The gloss and matte finish gives it a premium feel and the refurbished buttons help with that too. The one thing I'm less impressed with is the opacity of the plastic, which means in a darker environment, the light from the LEDs leaks through the shell. For a better quality feel, you could paint the insides of the shell before carrying out the process. Maybe I'll try that on another shell in future and let you know how that goes. Given this was such a cheap kit, it really got me excited as to the possibilities for just what might be achieved with Wiimote mods in future. I'm feeling really motivated to investigate further and try and get more modders involved to see if there's any potential in a scene for creating custom Wii controllers. So, thanks for watching, hello to my new viewers and welcome back to my returning viewers. If you enjoyed this then likes, comments, subs, signing up for notifications are always appreciated and if you'd like to support the making of future videos I've now got a Ko-fi page where you can leave a small donation if you're so inclined. I'll leave a link if that's something you'd be interested in. And while you're here why not check out some of my other videos. There should be a couple of links appearing over here with my last video and another that the YouTube algorithm thinks you should enjoy. This is Joe Bleeps signing off from the shed and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.